Hey everybody, Dr. James Surrett here. Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about my five-step guide on how to reverse insulin resistance for max weight loss. This is not going to be a cookie cutter video. I'm going to do a deep dive on it for you guys. Uh, I'm really excited about it. You should be too. Uh, and we're going to dive right into it. Now, if you clicked on this video, you probably already understand what insulin resistance is, but just to quickly recap why you should care about this is basically if you're having trouble losing weight, it's more than likely that you're struggling with insulin resistance. This can be one of the number one causes for weight gain and the inability to lose weight. These receptors become less sensitive over time. And we've, we can see that in research that the insulin receptors decrease in function as we age in most people. So the question here is, is how do we revamp things at the receptor level? Uh, most doctors out there uh, would agree that this could be reversed, but most patients are treated as if that this is not a possibility, that this is something that they're going to be struggling with as an in insulin resistance and resulting weight gain for the rest of their lives. So we're treated with medications or we treat patients with medications and we treat them as if there's nothing that can really be done, um, but that couldn't be further from the truth. So this five-step guide is really my signature five things that I do with my patients to help reverse insulin resistance. We're going to start number one with identifying the problem. I'm going to show you how to identify it, what needs to be run within blood work to identify it, and then move forward from there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be introducing a sample patient for you guys. We'll call her Monica. She's a 55-year-old female uh, in menopause, and she is on hormone replacement. She's been struggling to lose weight. Uh, that's her primary concern. Uh, her cholesterol is also through the roof, and she's been told that... Uh, she can't do anything about it. It's hereditary and she's absolutely out of luck. So let's go ahead and jump in into the diagnosis portion of insulin resistance because remember, you can't treat what you don't know and I always start off by doing this with my one-on-one -on -one clients. So let's jump into it. Okay, so these are Monica's labs that she came to me with. Um, this is a full panel. It's missing a couple things and I'll explain what it is that I would have liked to have seen. So. Primarily, when it comes to insulin resistance, we want to run a fasting insulin, um, and for that value, we want to see that as close to five as possible. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't run here. Most doctors don't run a fasting insulin, and so because of that, uh, you know, it, it, you have to look at some other components, and I'm going to show you guys that here. So if you're requesting labs to diagnose insulin resistance from your doctor, predominantly what you were looking for is a fasting insulin level. And if you're fasting, you see this at a 10, 15, 20, 30, um, that's significant insulin resistance. And even if your A1C, your average blood glucose, isn't elevated yet, it means that it will shortly be, that that is in your future and it's going to be on the rise. So we want to be able to diagnose this. Uh, one of the things that I do like to check is a cholesterol panel. So LDLC, this is the calculated cholesterol, what your doctors probably check each and every year for you. And on top of this, a LDL P. Uh, this is going to look at the particle counts. So of this cholesterol, what is the size distribution? Small, medium, large. We do not want to see small and medium LDL, specifically small LDL. So the higher this particle number, the higher assumed amount of particulate, meaning that there's just probably a lot of small LDL. And this is going to be what's oxidized into plaque ultimately. And then this is also uh, goes hand in hand with insulin resistance. So for this particular patient, you can see here, um, you know, she was told that there's nothing she can do about her cholesterol. She needs to go on a statin. She's in big trouble. Um, I would argue that uh, all the way. Um, but we've got 2,300. So she she's in that very high cardiovascular risk and insulin resistance uh, category. You can see here. They even did a uh, LPIR, that IR stands for insulin resistance here, and uh, they put her at a 67. So anything above 45 uh, here, they can they assume that, that there's a high level of insulin resistance. So this is a patient, um, you know, without going forward and sharing too many more details here, uh, might be a candidate for semaglutide or ozempic uh, at a low dosage, and we'll talk about that a little bit further on in the training. Um, but that LDLP is something that we would initially want to look at beyond the insulin resistance. Um, otherwise, snapshot blood glucose, assuming this was fasted test, and it was, uh, we don't really want to see this close to 100. It's at 91 here, so not too bad on the report card. Um, but we do want to see an A1C. And so let's jump down to that real fast. 
So here we have her hemoglobin A1C, the three month average blood sugar. 5.5 is definitely higher than we wanna see it. You can see her estimated average blood glucose. This just means that on any, at any given time, 111. We don't wanna see this over 100, ideally. Um, and that would mean that she needs to be between five and 5.2, typically. Now, 5.7 is pre-diabetic, so she's knocking on the door of this, and with that LDLP being elevated, um, I definitely would have that concern for her. Now, there's some other things that we would want to take a look at in the meantime. Um, here are some other tests that we'll, that we'll review when we go through another section. Uh, her cardiac, so HSCRP, this is vascular inflammation oriented, is here, and it's above a 3, 4.1. Another powerful indicator, there's insulin resistance present. One other marker here for insulin resistance is going to be your apolipoprotein B, what I believe to be one of the best researched uh, markers for cardiovascular plaque buildup um, uh, potential. And you can see here that very high is anything over 130. Ideal is less than 90. All of my patients that I work with, we shoot for 90 or below. Uh, now, when you're starting off this high, you got a ways to go. There's a lot of cardiovascular inflammation. Uh, there's a high likelihood of plaque development if it stays this high, um, but there is a lot that you can do. So again, we're just putting this stuff on the map and we're going to treat and watch this number drop. So step number two is going to be looking for hormonal abnormalities. Now in middle-aged people, this is going to be very prevalent. So in Monica's case, she is in menopause. Uh, which we'll be able to see here in a moment when we review her labs. I'll show you what we're looking for and what is out of balance. But when these hormones are out of whack, they do have an anti-inflammatory nature. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid hormone. These are all things that really need to be evaluated in people that want to reverse insulin resistance because when you're lacking these hormones, you're lacking their protective benefit. You're lacking their anti-inflammatory nature. These hormones are gonna be responsible just for your overall motivation, how you're feeling, your metabolic rate, your rate of recovery. So yeah, they're extremely important and we wanna make sure that we're giving them uh, fair due. Now let's take a quick look at Monica's hormonal imbalances and that will give you a really good indicator of what you might need to be taking a look at in yourself. So let's start with thyroid here. Um, so just right off the gate, or right out of the gates, her thyroid panel is not looking so hot. We have a TSH that's uh, that's over two and a half at 3.2. T4 is normal. Um, so right out of that, th this tells us that her pituitary gland is working too hard to communicate to her to produce thyroid hormone. So that should your ears should perk up as a provider and as a patient. Like, whoa, my TSH is over three. What's going on here? She's not on thyroid hormone currently. She's never been told she has a thyroid problem. So let's take a look. Her, her um, we'll come back to that FSH. Her free T3, this is active thyroid hormone, is 2.9. Uh, anyone under three, I typically medicate with either NP thyroid, uh, armor thyroid, uh, or if they prefer going synthetic, we'll do typically a blend between levothyroxine and leothyronine. Um, but the, the, the key component is there is making sure that there is some T3 components. So they're not relying on uh, that, that conversion between inactive T4 to T3. And I'll show you what I mean here. So we have a deficiency in T3, which is active thyroid hormone, which controls metabolic rate. Really the, the rate that you're going to lose weight. So this needs to be adjusted. Um, and uh, this is really helpful for reversing insulin resistance. The other issue here is that if you take a look at this T4, this T4 number is pretty normal. So She's making plenty of inactive hormone. She's just not, she doesn't have enough of that active hormone. Uh, and that, that lack in conversion could be due to her blood sugar uh, being out of whack. But temporarily, temp temporary thyroid replacement um, could be a really good call to get somebody some momentum. Um, hormonally, FSH, this just checks. We want to see that it's above 30. Um, so she's full blown in menopause at this point. Um, no ifs, ands, or uh, but it's about it. Um, now, she, remember what I said. She is on hormone replacement. So she's on estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So let's take a look here. Her estrogen levels, uh, this is really low for being on estrogen therapy. We really want to see those somewhere between 80 to 100, um, north of 50 for sure. So being at 14, I wouldn't be surprised if she's still getting hot flashes, so vasomotor symptoms, night sweats, things like that. Um, and you're not going to get as much protective nature out of your estrogen when it's this low uh, in the serum. 
and we'll show you a saliva test in just a second. Uh, beyond this, we have a progesterone. This is also very low. Um, I believe she's on 200 milligrams orally once every night. And this right here, I mean, this is this is extremely low. This isn't enough really to help somebody. So, um, yeah, it's registering, but the, you remember that the lab's zero is 0.5. Like it, it says 0.1, that it, but it can't actually even read that low. So um, this is really, really uh, on the low end. On top of this, we have her testosterone levels, uh, which at first glance, take a look at this. It's you, someone might say, "Oh, 21 total testosterone." It kind of falls in the middle there, between 10 and 50, um, or especially postmenopausal, more of what we're dealing with right here, uh, smack dab in the middle. So, okay, I can agree with that. Um, it's not great, but at least it's in the middle. But what happens is, is what happens when we come down here to free testosterone levels? Um, uh, at point eight, and it says anything is normal in post menopause, or just for a female in general, from zero to four point two is what's normal. Um, I can tell you right now from experience that women do not feel good at point eight. They feel better when they get closer to three or north of three. And when you're on testosterone therapy, oftentimes you're going to find yourself a little above a four. Uh, typically, I like to see that free testosterone level like five, six, seven. Um, if you're doing injections specifically, uh, she was actually doing creams here. And the, the sad thing in this case is that she was actually underdosed. So, uh, when you underdose, basically what you're doing is, is you're giving your body less testosterone than, than it would have made itself. And that is setting someone up for failure. So if you're a provider out there or a patient that is on testosterone therapy and your labs are coming back looking like this, just know that you are likely underdosed. You either need to change dosage or change form. Um, very, very important, especially with uh, blood sugar control, because it's going to help. Testosterone is going to help with recovery. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but uh, this is a saliva test that the patient had done as well. Uh, and so you can see that this is a cortisol test that they did a morning, uh, afternoon, and nighttime, along with a DHEA. Um, this patient's adrenals are shot. It just means I, I put it here in red. So low levels across the board like this just mean that her adrenals are burned out. She's not producing much cortisol um, and that her adrenal function is quite low. Um, also, you could see that there's low DHEA output, which is just another adrenal hormone that has the ability to convert to testosterone. Uh, and so this is just another uh, idea for treatment. Sometimes we'll supplement with DHEA. Um, you do have to be careful when you pair that with testosterone therapies. You can increase things like acne sometimes. Um, now, this is also confirmatory to what we just saw in the blood work. I really like having these tests uh, done, the saliva test, in conjunction with the blood work because blood work isn't perfect and saliva gives a better representation. So here, like your, the estrogen, it says it's normal, but it's 0.5, low end of normal. She's got low estriol which can cause vaginal dryness in women. Um, her progesterone's just outright low with supplementation. So that really needs to be addressed um, for, for sleep quality. Uh, testosterone's low and she's on treatment, DHE's low. So this just reaffirms what we're talking about before. So just to fill you in what I did with this particular patient, when it came to the hormone side of things, uh, we did MP thyroid, so we corrected the thyroid imbalance. We increased the progesterone I switched the testosterone from a cream base, a low, it was a very, very low concentration cream base to injections, uh, which is going to be really helpful for her, I'm sure. Um, and then I also switched from an estrogen patch to an estrogen cream at a higher dosage. So the combination between these things, again, the desired effect is to decrease systemic inflammation, enhance recovery, and just make it easier to uh, reverse that insulin resistance that's present in the body. And now we have a good foundation to address diet, lifestyle, and some other treatment options. If you guys are liking this content and you want more information, you want more guidance, you want more help in reversing insulin resistance, reversing that weight gain, getting that weight off and keeping it off, whether that be with GLP-1 medications like semaglutide or naturally, go ahead and check it out below. We have a program called Semaglutide Secrets Weight Loss Program and Course. Check it out. It's got everything that you need to be able to reverse that once and for all. Now on to the next step. All right, you guys, so step number three is simply going to be evaluating what other GLP-1 stimulating things that we can do for Monica within her treatment plan. Now remember, as I said before, GLP-1 activation or those insulin receptors function go down 
over time as we age. So our goal is, is to say, hey, what's going to wake these puppies up? So one of the things I like to use is semaglutide, Ozempic, Wegovi, these GLP-1 uh, agonist drugs. And actually, I, I don't even count them as drugs. They're more peptide therapies to me, uh, meaning that they're just going to make these receptors a little bit more sensitive, enhance the function that they already should have, causing the body to require less insulin and really help um, reverse insulin resistance while you're on the medication. Now, when I do recommend these medications, I always recommend them at the lowest possible dose to keep side effects to a minimum. I don't recommend prescribing as to what's on the box that, you know, every two weeks, just keep increasing dosage and keep increasing, keep increasing. Uh, that's a recipe for disaster, setting your patient up for dependency to be on the medication for life and uh, yeah, likely a lot of side effects. So the lowest possible dosage and you're going to hold them there as long as they're having success and until they can hit their weight loss goal. And then you're going to wean them off the medication it would be my tactic in this case. Um, now, let's say that you're like, oh, I, I hate medications or I'm not, I'm against Ozempic, I'm against peptides. Okay, that's just fine. But we still want to think about things that can activate GLP-1. And we do know of a few things that are out there. Uh, my favorite probiotic that's on the market at the moment uh, is Acromantia. Uh, Pendulum makes the product. I'll, I'll put a link down below uh, so you can pick up that product if you'd like. But um, my favorite version of the product is called uh, Glucose Control. So there is a combination of probiotics in there that have been researched and shown to impact GLP-1. This is the same probiotic that we use to help wean people off of semaglutide and ozempic after they've been on it for a period of months and we're weaning them off, uh, trying to get them off of it completely. And we don't want that whiplash effect where like someone's on a medication and then one day they're just off of the medication. So what we'll do is, is we'll add in a supplement like glucose control, uh, which has the acromantia active probiotic strain to help continue to stimulate that GLP-1 receptor um, to lessen the demand of insulin on the system. Whichever way you go, you know, can't go wrong. One is a little bit more heavy handed with the semaglutide or the GLP-1 approach. Um, but that is a favorite of mine in conjunction with diet and lifestyle and, and doing some other things right. I figure with this type of an approach, you have the ability to hit things from all angles, right? So you're hitting things from the hormonal imbalance side. Um, you're able to go ahead and hit things from the GLP-1 side. And we're going to start to get into some other areas that are also going to make a big impact and make those other two reverse that insulin resistance that much faster. Step number four is going to be diet, but don't just shut it off because you have read a bunch of other diet blogs and watched a bunch of other YouTube videos on diet. My philosophy with uh, within this is definitely unique, uh, and I place a large emphasis on diet when it comes to avoidance of foods that you're sensitive to. And there may be foods in your diet that you're eating currently that are causing inflammation that you don't even know that you're sensitive to. Biggest example out there. I always pick on dairy and I always tell my clients to stop eating or consuming dairy because of its inflammatory nature, right? And you might be like, oh, er, like you might be like a really pro dairy person. That's okay. But listen to this for a second. If even if you are, here's the test. Stop eating all dairy for a month, three weeks, even just stop the cheese, sour cream, milk, all products, whey, everything. Then go ahead and at the end of the three weeks, drink a big glass of milk and tell me how you feel. If you feel great, awesome. Then maybe you're an anomaly and it's not causing inflammation for you. For the rest of us, uh, typically we do not break down uh, the casein very well uh, or the lactose very well. Um, so there's two components of the dairy we don't usually break down well as a species. Imagine that there is a level of inflammation that happens when we consume dairy. And that's my point is that if you are having inflammation that's present, that is going to impact your cortisol or stress response, which in turn upregulates blood sugar, changes your blood sugar levels, um, which is how somebody can become a diabetic without drinking Coca-Cola and eating Cinnabons all day. If you just eat simply, simply eat something that you're sensitive to, you can influence your blood sugar just as much and your LDL and LDL particle counts just as much. Those LDL and those blood sugar and the insulin, they all travel together in a pack. When they go up, they go up. When they go down, they go down. So dietarily, 
you want to be thinking about what could I be sensitive to? Now, in our programs that we run, our weight loss programs, we typically have people remove dairy, nightshade vegetables, and legumes, legumes. People have given me crap in my other videos for saying legumes, legumes. That's for you guys, legumes. Uh, we have people avoid those three categories of foods, and it helps reduce the water weight. Uh, so it helps from a weight loss standpoint, but it's also going to help from that insulin standpoint by reducing your blood sugar likely. Now, like other popular opinions on the internet, we do want to stabilize blood sugar and control insulin through the consumption of protein. Now, I prefer animal-based proteins, and you may have heard me harp on this in other YouTube videos. It's so important. Women, you have to get north of 60 grams of protein per day. Typically, men, north of 100 grams of protein per day. And I like that spread out throughout the entire day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, snacks, to help just balance that blood glucose. Um, you know, I totally get the concept of intermittent fasting towards the end of the day or the beginning of the day. Um, typically, I don't have my semaglutide patients doing this, but let's just say that you're not on any GLP-1 support and you are implementing intermittent fasting, then I would really strongly encourage you to do your fast um, in conjunction with your night's sleep. Don't eat a meal in the beginning of the day, fast for like 10 hours, and then eat a dinner. Um, that is not going to be helpful um, when it comes to reversing insulin resistance at all. And I see a lot of people doing that. Um, that is just a really great way to slow your metabolism down, and we don't want to see it. So in summary, avoid dietary intolerances, pump up that protein, and that will help stabilize your blood sugar overall and reverse insulin resistance. Step number five is physical activity. And I'm going to be sharing with you the two W's of physical activity. A little bit different approach. One is strictly for weight loss and one is for re reversing insulin resistance. They're slightly different. The two W's get split. So the first W is strictly going to be from a weight loss side of things. With weight loss, all you really have to do is walk. And typically that's walk more than you're used to walking currently when you're not losing weight. So I tell people to bump that up by about 20%, and it does tend to work quite well. That, however, is not going to help reverse insulin resistance quickly. It might help reverse insulin resistance over time, but if you're looking for like, if you see, you know, if your doctors run those labs and you're seeing a bunch of red, if you're seeing that fasting insulin up 20, 30, you need to do something drastic, um, and walking might not get you there fast. Um, the other W is going to be weights. So strength training, resistance training, at least three times a week uh, for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and that's going to be anything beyond your physiologic weight. What does that mean? Um, think of your physiologic weight, like doing a body weight squat, a body weight push up. You want to load the body more than that, more than what your, your actual weight would be. Uh, and that, and you want to be able to push yourself. Um, don't hurt yourself, but you want to be able to push yourself a little bit. And just that act of doing that is going to help reverse insulin resistance faster. It's been shown in research to be more effective than uh, cardiovascular uh, or just walking training. I hope you guys enjoyed the training here. Obviously, there are other ways to reverse insulin resistance, but these are just my top five. Obviously, we want to identify the problem, and the other four steps are just things that you can do to enhance the capability of you actually turning back the dial. Remember what I said, if your doctor has told you something absolute, like you cannot lose the weight, you cannot get your cholesterol down, you cannot reverse this insulin resistance, you guys, that's just a bunch of baloney. Don't listen to them. Follow these steps and it will serve you well. Uh, if you enjoy these videos, go ahead and hit me with a thumbs up, uh, like and follow. Uh, if you're enjoying the content, uh, we release content every week. Uh, it means the world to me. If you want to do me an extra favor, go ahead and throw, ahead, throw something in the comments there. Uh, it just gives me a little algorithm boost and it helps push the channel forward and I really appreciate it. Until next week, guys. Take care.